بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Our workshop for today and tomorrow, insha'Allah, is with this beautiful book, not all of it, because to go through all of it, we would probably need like seven to eight months, seriously, every day. Because to go through a hadith, a one hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, you need volumes. The Prophet said والسلام, about himself that he was given the concise of speech. And this is, this is your course, right? Khalas? Wallah, I don't know how this goes. Part one, okay. So, when you go through a hadith of the Prophet والسلام, you find so much knowledge squeezed into a single or couple of words. And to explain this, you need volumes. So, for example, the Prophet says, la darar wa la dirar. Two words. And this is one of the legal maxims in Islam. Al-Qawa'id al in Islam. And the scholars spoke extensively about it. Innam al-a'malu bin niyat Everybody knows this hadith. It is one-third, as Imam Shafi'i says, it is one-third of the entire Islam. When the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, Ya Aba Umair, ma'adha fa'ala nughayr? Four words, hadith. Imam al-Shafi'i said, when al -imam, he went to Imam Ahmad to sleep over. And uh, footnote, don't think I'm wasting time. I am. <laughs> the material we have, I don't think I'm going to be able to go through it. But as long as I'm not going to finish it, might as well waste time. <laughs> Imam Shafi'i went to sleep over at Imam Ahmad. So the maid put water after Isha in front of his room so that he can make wudu and pray night prayer. At Fajr time, she met Imam Ahmad and said, this is Imam Shafi'i you talk about? He is not worthy of your praise. He didn't even pray night prayer. What kind of a alim, what kind of a scholar is he? He, he smiled. He did not reply. After they prayed Fajr, Imam Ahmad was chit-chatting with Imam Shafi'i and said, the maid says so-and-so about you. She, he said, she's right. I didn't pray night prayer. I spent the whole night from Isha till Fajr contemplating on the hadith of Anas. When the Prophet came to our house and I had this young brother called uh, uh, Aba Umair. He's nicknamed Aba Umair. He had a small bird, Nur. So the Prophet is jokingly with him because the bird died and the four-year-old child was upset. So the Prophet said, Aba Umair, ماذا فعل النغير? What did the young bird do? He's joking with him. He said, Imam Shafi'i, I spent the whole night contemplating on these words and I got a number and yani, over 80 over eight zero benefits out of it. He collected from this. So when we speak about the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, this is not a simple thing to go through. It's a serious topic. Why choose Al-Adab Al-Mufrad? First of all, because of the compiler. Who's the compiler? Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. And whenever you hear Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, you think of an authentic hadith. Even if you don't know Arabic, 
If someone says Bukhari, you know, the leader and the president of Nigeria is Buhari. At the moment, he's a general. So when he says something, everybody says, next week I'll be in Nigeria, so hope, pray for me that I don't go into trouble. They're good people, mashallah. Now, Imam al-Bukhari is Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim al-Bukhari, one of the great scholars of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah, the real Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah, those who follow the footsteps of the Prophet those who have sound aqeedah, who believe in the Quran as it is, who believe in the sunnah of the Prophet and follow it extensively, not choose and pick. These are the Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah. He is the compiler of Al-Jami' al-Sahih, known to us as Sahih al-Bukhari. His way of acquiring knowledge was phenomenal. And he started acquiring knowledge. He started to be a student of knowledge when he was, how old? 10 years of age. When he was 11, he used to debate with his scholars and shiukh, correcting them, them being angry because he's correcting them. And when they check, they come back to him and say, we're sorry, you're right. And they correct their mistakes from this 11 year old child. When he was 16, he started to spread his wings. And people from all over the world used to meet him and tell him in the thousand to sit and teach them the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And he traveled all over the Muslim countries to gain. He had a thousand and eighty teacher, shuyukh. From each sheikh, he learned more than 10,000 hadiths, authentic and weak. And he filtered them all to bring us the sahih. The sahih of al-Bukhari, as you know, is compiled according to chapters in Bid al-Wahi, in a salah, zakah, buyur, marriage, transactions, according to the fiqhi books. One of the chapters is about adab, but it is not related to our book. Because in that chapter of al-adab, which is all authentic, unlike our book, this book, Al-Adab al-Mufrad is not 100% authentic. Why? Because Al-Bukhari had a condition that in his Sahih, he would not report anything except with a particular condition that gives it the highest grade of authenticity. 98 octane uh, premium or 90, which is regular. He had premium in Sahih. In Adab al-Mufrad, it was mixed. And the condition was less. And the bar was lower. Why? Because the people of al-Bukhari, like today, when we meet, you say, uh, how much is the dollar per the ringgit? You say, four point so. At that time, everybody knew the isnad. So when I tell you, haddathana so-and-so, that so-and-so said, that so-and-so heard, that Abu Huraira narrated that the Prophet said, they know that this hadith is authentic or not authentic. Not because they're scholars, but knowledge was so spread that as long as you put the chain of narrators, it's sufficient, it's enough. So the Bukhari put this, which has so much information about adab, but not as authentic as the Sahih al-Bukhari itself. Okay, then why compile it? Because the issue of adab, the thing that elevates your moral conduct, your ethics, has so many hadiths that may not reach the premium level of hadith, but it is authentic. So that's why he 
brought us this hadith which, or this book, which is approximately three to four times bigger than the one in his Sahih al-Bukhari, so that we could learn of and about. So what does it speak about? Adab is a general word that deals with your moral conduct, how you behave, how you think, how you act in Islamic terminology. In Arabic, we say he has little adab, meaning that he is impolite. Qalilul adab in Arabic. This is an insult. He's impolite. And the word adab has a general Arabic meaning that includes literature, poetry, um, uh, writing of articles. All of this is included in an adab. However, the, the book that we have at hand, which is not this one, definitely. This one, Bukhari initially did not call it al-adab al-mufrad. Usually when I speak on stage, I like to make the cameraman's life difficult. So I move from one place to the other. So I guarantee that he gets his money's worth. <laughs> yes, life is difficult. Life is difficult. I can afford this. I'm the sheikh. <laughs> so coming back, he called it juz al-adab. The, those who came afterwards added the word al-mufrad so that they can distinguish it from other things. Now, usually when people come to a workshop, they have deliverables. I spent a lot of time thinking, why are people coming to this workshop? And what are they expecting to have? I couldn't find an answer, seriously. Seriously, I could not find an answer. Why would you come here? What would you expect to come out and say, MashaAllah, I know when to do sujood al-sahu, before salam and after salam. Alhamdulillah. I know how to perform witr prayer, whether one, three, five, seven, or nine rak'ahs with one salam or not. The zakat, what are the deliverables that you will have? To normal people, not much. Seriously. It's going to be refreshing, a little bit fun, maybe. For me, I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. Coming all the way from Saudi Arabia, not paying anything, getting first class treatment. <laughs> I'll enjoy it, staying away from my wife and kids. <laughs> this is a blessing by itself. <laughs> but for you, what will you gain? Nothing, unfortunately, unless you come with an open heart. And you come to learn the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. You come to learn how to behave, how to fix my inner self. Some of us has rage problems. Some of us are selfish. Some of us cannot be honest. Some of us have has to deal with deception and cheating and double talk in their work, in their homes. If you come here to fix all of this, you will benefit, inshallah. But if you come here just, you know, I don't have anything better to do, you will benefit the reward, but you will not get the chance to purify your heart. There is nothing, there's, there won't be any crying and weeping. Oh, of course, if your heart is too open, there will be. Because whenever we are with the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, we remember the beautiful days. Our biggest and strongest and most profound calamity on earth is the death of our Prophet to the extent that he said, whenever a calamity strikes you, poverty, you, lo you lose a house, you lose uh, a son, you divorce, you have problems. Whenever a calamity strikes you, remember your loss in me. And this would make your calamity go away. 
So if you have a problem, remember that I lost the opportunity to see and meet the Prophet and he's dead. This is the biggest calamity that could ever strike a person. So, will we be able to benefit from this? Inshallah, we'll give it a try. If it works, Alhamdulillah. If it doesn't work, tough luck. You can do anything about it. So let's begin, inshallah, with the first. No. With part one, hadith. No, you, who has the book? MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Good. So you can follow with me. I don't know if they have notes that they can write down because it's going to be a little bit, a lot of information. 90%, if not more, is known to you. But to have it collected and reminded with may, might be a little bit yani, difficult. So chapter number one, we discover that Imam al-Bukhari in his book did not write any introduction. So he started right away with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. However, this is a piece of information that is quite beneficial for you. In Sahih al-Bukhari, not our book, in Sahih al-Bukhari, you will find that Imam al-Bukhari also did not write an introduction. Why? Because what to introduce when you come to the prophets saying alayhi salatu wasalam. So what did the Bukhari do? Ah. The scholars say that the knowledge of Imam al-Bukhari is displayed in the titles. So his knowledge, his fiqh, what he learns, he puts in the small statement, the title. Then he puts the hadith to show you that the hadith exactly is translated and interpreted to his title. So likewise, the Bukhari had done this in the very beginning. He said, one, بَابُ قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حُسْنًا This is the beginning of an ayah that Allah Azza wa Jal has said, we have enjoined man to be kind to his parents. Okay, what do we understand of this? You have to be kind to your parents. Okay, understood? We move to hadith number two. No, 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 no. It's not gonna be that easy. There is one hadith in this chapter. You find it in English. I don't think it is in Arabic. Is it? No, it's only in, in English. So, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. See, if I want to spend the whole day speaking about this hadith, I can, with the grace of Allah Azza wa Talking about Abdullah ibn Mas'ud by itself is sufficient. What do you know about Abdullah ibn Mas'ud? Anyone? Because I can see people are sleeping. We have a long day ahead of us, so no time to sleep. It is very possible that I will point at you and I say, please stand up. You say, I paid money. Stand up. Who cares you paid money? I come from Saudi Arabia. I don't care about money. I will tell you, stand up and I ask you a question so that I guarantee you do not sleep during the process. If you sleep, I'll sleep. So what do you know about Abdullah bin Mas'ud? You raise your hand. The brother, second row, third. You raise your hand. Oh, you're doing your hair. <laughs> ah, watch out. Huh? What do you know about Abdullah bin Mas'ud? Anyone? <laughs> of course, he's a companion. That's a good, yes. No, it's close. The Prophet said, learn the Quran from poor people. Ibn Ummi Abd, Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Salim Mawla Hudayfa, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, Zayd ibn Thabit. These are the four people whom the Prophet told us to learn the Quran. One of them is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, I took 70 plus 
surahs of the Quran straight from the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ. So only 40 left. He took 70 plus. So this man is knowledgeable. First of all, he said to the Prophet, I asked him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which deeds Allah loves best. So what do we learn from this? One, we learn that the companions are so keen on asking what benefits them, what gets them closer to Allah. Compare apple to apple. What do you usually look up for? What do you ask for? I personally ask about the exotic car's price when it's secondhand. I cannot afford to buy them brand new. This is my obsession. Ah, oh, from zero to 100. My car is excellent from zero to 100, half an hour. Very old, very vintage, very slow. So people have obsessions. If a brother has an obsession on motorbikes. Is it a Ducati or a Kawasaki? A sister has obsession on the latest foundation. Is it waterproof? Is it breathable? So obsessions. The companion's obsession was not like this. Their obsession was, what benefits me at the side of Allah? What takes me to Jannah? And therefore, those who called me eight, ten times a week from Australia, from Canada, from America, it costs money. But they ask, they ask straight questions. Sheikh, what's the ruling on this? If I do this better or do that better? I feel astonished because they want to get closer to Allah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was like this. So he comes to the Prophet. He doesn't say, Prophet of Allah, should I buy property in Putrajaya or in somewhere else? No. He wants what gets him closer to Allah. So he says to the Prophet والسلام, which deeds Allah loves best. So the Prophet والسلام, lists a number of tasks. One, prayer. Two, being dutiful to the parents. And three, jihad in the way of Allah. And Abdullah ibn Saud said, if I asked the Prophet more, he would have given me more. So what do we benefit from this hadith? First of all, the keenness of the companions to ask for what benefits them. And this is found in most of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You always find a sahabi coming and asking the Prophet ﷺ about things that are most beloved to Allah. Yet, we find the answer varies. Why? The scholars say, because the Prophet answers alayhi salatu wasalam whenever you hear the name of the Prophet, or for salam. Otherwise, you will be stingy at the side of Allah. Anytime you hear the name of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you offer salam. You gain 10 good deeds. Allah mentions you in the higher uh, uh, congregation and you get closer to Allah. So the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gives answer according to each one's individual. One says, O Prophet of Allah, awsini, give me advice. He said, do not become angry. Why? Because the Prophet knows that this guy is, has a rage problem. The other one says, O Prophet of Allah, Awsini, advise me. He said, your tongue is continuously remembering Allah. The fourth, third one asks and said, help me by performing a lot of, of sujood, meaning a lot of prayers, offer a lot of prayers, and so on. So what is the most dearer deed to Allah Azza wa Jal? One, to pray on time. In another narration, to pray at the beginning of the time. We can go for a long time discussing this. It's beneficial to know when to pray at the beginning of the time and when not to pray at the beginning of the time. Because some prayers, delaying it is more preferred to Allah. But if we get engaged in this, 
I promise you will not be able to finish not even one-tenth of the course. So let us focus on what is essential. This is beneficial. How many people in Malaysia pray on time? I was shocked. Now people usually when they are asked straightforward questions, they get defensive. Meaning, you're not opening your heart. When I say, how many people in Malaysia pray on time, defensive people say, how many people in Saudi pray on time? <laughs> yeah, I'm the one who's preaching, not you. <laughs> don't preach me, I'm preaching you. So don't be defensive. Even in Saudi Arabia, they don't pray on time. In Egypt, in Syria, in Morocco, everywhere. And this is why we are going downhill because the prophet told us the most important deed to allah جل, is your prayer and our prayer is downhill this is why everything in the muslim world is downhill until we revive the sunnah i was shocked to find that people are too relaxed when it comes to prayer i'm a traveler there's no masjid i can pray anywhere and I shortened the prayer from four to two. But what about the locals? When they pick me from one place to the other, we pass by masjids, no one says, let's stop and pray. And maybe they delay the prayers. And I see Muslims, their, mashallah, their offices are open, their shops are open, the music is open. Where is Islam? I don't know. So. If we can benefit from this, that we put as our objective to pray on time in congregation in the masjid, then we have gained 70% of the course. If we can get this. If we fail to pray on time in the masjid, what are you doing? Having fun. Well, let's continue. The problem is that the more you have knowledge of Allah, the keen you are to pray on time. The less knowledge of Allah's beautiful names and attributes, the careless you are. This is a well-known fact. Now, the importance of salah is a lot. We will not go into that, except that you have to know in the beginning, it was how many? 50, five zero. And then Allah reduced it into five. Imagine that if we have to pray every half an hour, that would be great for our course because we would have a break every 25 minutes. But will anybody be able to do it? No. Allah, the most generous, made it five. And even the five, we have 40% discount. Fajr, we don't pray on time. Asr, we're at work. This is how people are, unfortunately. Those who do not pray at all are not Muslims. If you do not pray at all, not a single salah, you are a kafir. Even if you say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, 1,000 times a day, and perform hajj and fast Ramadan and give zakat. If you do not pray at all, you are a kafir. This is the Prophet's fatwa, not mine, alayhi salatu wasalam. If you pray on and off, you're a hypocrite. You are a hypocrite because Allah described in the Quran, in chapter 9, Surah At-Tawbah, those who are lazy to pray, but they pray. They are hypocrites. So it's a serious stuff. Number two. Uh, no. Where is number two? And after that, he said, no. Yeah, oh, I was following you. That's nice. Uh, it's time, said, dutifulness to parents. What is the meaning of dutifulness? In Arabic, it's called bir. Birrul walidain. Now, the word to be dutiful is a very, very large word with lots of meanings. The majority of the people in Malaysia, alhamdulillah, and in Southeast Asia, have this instilled in them. The respect, the obedience, the kindness, 
the majority, not all. There are always black sheep in the family. So Allah Azza wa Jal has ordered us to be dutiful to our parents, even if they are kafir. So regardless of the religion of the parent, you must be dutiful to them. Now, what is the sense of being dutiful? First of all, how important it is. Allah Azza wa Jal has combined in a number of ayahs in the Quran between Tawheed and being dutiful to your parents. Allah has ruled that you must not worship anyone other than him and to be dutiful and kind to your parents. How strong would you want Allah's command to be more than this? To associate it with Tawheed, which is the essence of Islam, which is the sole purpose of our existence is to worship Allah. After that, to be dutiful to your parents. Now, Muslim families pride on having their parents and grandparents living in their homes. They fight for it. I know families, I know siblings, brothers, fighting over their mother where to stay. Each one says, I'm worthy of her staying with me, to the extent that there was a case in court in Riyadh where two brothers over 70 years of age, both, went to the judge and complained that their mother should be with him. They're fighting to have their parents with them. And the people, when it comes to being dutiful to your parents are three types. One is the person who goes out of his way to be kind, loving, and obedient. He does more than what they expect of him, and he never says anything bad to them. So this guy is the one who's dutiful. Now, who is the one who's not dutiful? The one who is not dutiful, as the scholars say, is the one who does his obligations to his parents and he does not harm them. This is the interpretation of what? People are asleep of being not dutiful. Did you hear me well? A person who does his obligations. I give my mother and father shelter. I give them pocket money. I put food on their table. I never insult them. I never speak rude to them. I never, but this is it. Obligations and staying away from haram. They say he is not dutiful. The third type is the one who does not do his obligations and he's insultive, he's uh, uh, abusive, he raises his voice, he looks at them straight in the eye when speaking to them. You know that this is a sin. When your father or mother are speaking to you and you look them straight in the eye. So your father tells you, why did you come late yesterday? And you look at him and said, I'm a grown up man. I can come whenever I want. This is sinful. You will go to hell because of this. So now most of us are from category number two. We do our obligations and we don't do any sins. Yet we are sinful for that. What Allah tells you to do is to be extra dutiful, extra respectful, more than what they expect from you then you will be fulfilling Allah's command to you. A man came to Abdullah ibn Umar, shivering, shaking out of fear, 
complaining to him. And he said, O oh, companion of, Allah, of the Prophet I did so many sins. And he thinks that these sins are major sins. So Ibn Umar asked him, are your parents alive? He said, I only have my mother and she's with me. Ibn Umar said, are you afraid of fire? Do you love to enter paradise? By Allah, if you speak to your mother softly and feed her food, by Allah, you will enter paradise as long as you refrain from major sins. This is how the companions used to treat their parents. This is how they used to consider obeying the parents coming to hand. A questions at the end of the session, right? Any questions quickly? Okay, alhamdulillah, people are asleep. Second, um, hadith number three. Hadith number three was mentioned in chapter number two. Dutifulness to one's mother. So why is this not considered to be segregation? Why the West is not considering us to be feminist when it comes here? They say that we segregate between men and women and men are better than women. Look at this hadith and you will learn that this is not true. The authority of Muawiyah ibn Haida, what's his name in Arabic? I don't know. Uh, Muawiyah ibn Haida, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet said, that he asked the Prophet, you're O Prophet of Allah, who should, whom should I be dutiful most? He said, your mother, then your mother, then your mother, then your father, then the next nearest relative, and then the next nearest. So this hadith talks about the issue of being kind to your mother more than anyone else. Why? Why does Islam encourage us to be more tolerant, more kind to the mother than the father? First of all, by experience, who do you fear most, father or the mother? Father, no one thinks twice. You fear your father more than your mother. That's why you always take the shortcut. Mother, I need this, I need that. Why ask me, ask your father? No, 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 I cannot ask him, you ask him. So you keep on insisting on your mother more than your father. My wife, when it comes to waking up the girls for Fajr prayer, she spends 40 minutes waking them up. And she comes with years on her shoulders coming, I'm tired, I cannot do this. Can you help? I said, yeah, sure. Hey, wake up. <laughs> Immediately they wake up. I don't know why. I don't have a stick in my hand, but this is something that Allah has put in the father. The mother can, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Ah, Sam, they're not listening to me. I said, bint meaning girl, and khalas, stops. That's it. I never beat them, I never shout at them, but this is sufficient, this is from Allah. Not because I'm a sheikh, I know all of you have experienced this. This is why it is extremely important, threefold, than the father to be dutiful to your mother. Why? The mother is weak, the mother is vulnerable, the mother can be insulted by the son or by the daughter, while the father wouldn't be. The mother had, has more rights over you than your father. Why? It's the father who buys me the car. It's the father that provides for me the shelter, the food, the clothes, the school. What does my mother do? The mother does everything. She's the one who carried you in her womb for nine months. And if you see the agony and the pain of 
labor. Us men we cannot do this. Can, can you be with your wife in, in labor time? No, I cannot. I sit and cry next to her. I, I, this is not, I cannot do this. Yes, I can go to the gym and I can work out for two hours without her. I cannot have the pain she's having. And after that, sleepless nights for at least a year. When the child is suffering, stomach ache, breastfeeding, not sleeping on time, I usually kick my wife out. Say, live next door. And they say, I want to, I have work, I have to sleep. She has no problem. So all of this, and you go on from year one or two until you are a grown-up man and she cares for you. Whenever you're sick, whenever you're hungry, whenever your clothes need ironing, whenever you have a problem, you don't go to your father and say, Father, I met this girl and I love her. He will smack you in the eye. <laughs> You'll go to your mom. He says, huh? how old is she? Where does she come from? She is affectionate. She, she has a lot of feelings for you. She loves your success, and she loves you when you fail. Your father loves you only when you succeed. When, you're fa when you fail, you're not my son. You're somebody else. But now, when you are doing well, he loves you. Your mother loves you no matter what happens. Even if you're a drug addict, even if you go to prison, even if you are the imam of al-haram, she loves you. And you're always her child until you get married then you're someone else's child. This is why she's jealous from her sister, from her daughter-in-law, and problems come. This is not our problem anymore. <laughs> Let's not go into that. So, being dutiful to your mother is extremely important in Islam. In the book, Al-Bukhari, Al-Adab Al-Mufrat, there is a hadith, beautiful hadith, it's not with us today. When Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was in Hajj. And this Ye Ye Yemeni man from Yemen has his crippled mother on his shoulders. So she's like 40 kgs. Nothing much, but imagine carrying her all the way and putting her on your shoulder. And he's doing tawaf. And while doing tawaf, he says in poetry, إِنِّي لَهَا بَعِيرُهَا الْمُذَلَّلِ إِن تُذْعَرْ رِكَابُهَا لَمْ أُذْعَرِ He's boasting, saying that I, I am my, mother, my mother's humble camel. If all the rides around are scared, I am never scared. And I'm always carrying her uh, 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 with bravery. And then he looked at Ibn Umar, doing tawaf with your mom on your back. I know people ashamed from holding their mother's hands in the market, getting her out of the, the, the car and getting her into the car, helping her when they're 70 or 80 years of age, ashamed. This is not befitting. Why doesn't the maid come? Why doesn't my sister come? Well, so he says to Ibn Umar, oh, Ibn Umar, do you think I have repaid my mother? Doing hajj, carrying her. This is something, who can tolerate this? Ibn Umar said, by Allah, you have not even repaid one construction of her labor. Even one pain of her labor, just a single one, this is not sufficient. Now, compare apple to apple. When was the last time you kissed your mother's feet? When was the last time you brought joy into your mother's heart, being dutiful? Compare how you treat your wife and how you treat your mother. I will not go into rights because this would require probably a different workshop and it will make people angry. However, this is يعني, important for you to think the wife has to think, how does she treat her mother and her husband? Although her husband comes as a priority, this doesn't mean that you cannot be kind, call her every day six, seven times. I know people who live in the same city, see their mother only twice a week, for half an hour. From my relatives, they come to see their mother for one hour a week, they live maybe 
half an hour apart. What kind of a, a son is this? If you don't stick to your mother's feet, even if she's a kafir, even if she's not a Muslim, this is the time to show her the beauty of Islam by being a real Muslim. See, talk is cheap. I can talk forever, but you judge me according to my actions. I judge you according to your actions, not on how many hadiths you know by heart or what you do or what you do not do. Now, if we look at how the people of the Salaf used to deal with their mother, you'll be shocked. I'll give you a few examples. Urwa ibn Zubair is the nephew of Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her. You know Aisha, the mother of the believers. He said, if your parents anger you, never ever look at them straight in the eye with anger. How many times have your children looked at you in anger? It's like a stab in the heart. Sometimes we do it and we do not realize it. Your father, your mother says a remark you don't like. What do you do? You give them this look that they wish they had not brought you into this world because of that. Your mother says, your wife did not call me for a whole week. And you look at her like this. You're not a dutiful son. You're a bad son. He says, Muhammad ibn Sirin, may Allah have mercy on his soul, one of the great tabi'een. Whenever he was at the court of his mother, he used to lower his voice to the extent that people thought he was sick just because he was in the presence of his mother. Look at the respect they had. When you are at your mother's side, what do you do? You laugh, you joke, you raise your voice until your mom says, lower it down a little bit. This is not the way of the Salaf. He used to lower his voice until people thought he was sick. One of the Salaf, his mother calls him from the end of the hall or the house. And he says, yes, mom, so that she can hear him. And he thinks, ah, what have I done? I raised my voice. He frees two slaves. He thinks that he had done a sin. He frees two slaves for the sake of Allah to compensate for his sin. A lot of the Salaf, and this is narrated by a number of scholars, they used to refuse to eat with their mother from the same dish. Why? They says, I'm afraid that my mother would have looked at something she liked and my hand was quicker. Now, if you sit with your mom and with a dish of fruit in front of you, before even she looks, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, he cleaned the plate white and his mother even did not reach out. No, the Salaf would not do this. They would always give preference to their mother, let her eat after she's finished and satisfied, you may try to eat as well. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ wanting to perform jihad. So the Prophet asked him, is your mother there? He says, yes, she's alive. She said, stay with her. He asked him twice. He asked him three times. And then the Prophet told him, stick next to her feet because paradise is there. Now, compare this hadith to the many youngsters who come and say, we want to go to Syria for jihad. We want to go to Iraq for jihad. We want to go to Afghanistan. We want to go to this and that for jihad. MashaAllah, good. What did the Prophet say, salam? Stick close to your mother's feet. Shaykh, this is difficult, wallah. To stay next to my mother's feet and obey her, this is difficult. I'd rather have a bullet. This is strange. People do not understand Islam as it's supposed to be. There are priorities. Follow the priorities, you enter Jannah. Follow your own priorities. I don't guarantee that you will enter anywhere you want. Now, one would say, my mother is evil. There are evil mothers. Yes. Are there, are there evil mothers? Astaghfirullah. Yes, there are. 
This is a fact of life. However, this is your test. I get so many phone calls from sisters crying, from brothers complaining of how evil their mothers are. And they're right. But this is their test from Allah. If your mother was kind, loving, compassionate, and willing to do anything for you, where is the test of being dutiful? You have to be respectful and dutiful. The test is when it's the opposite. So we have a lot of mothers complaining about their sons' treatment to their wives, especially in what is known as the joint family. This is found in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, etc., where whenever you get married, you get your wife as a new servant in the house. She cooks and cleans and acts like a maid, not only to your parents, but to your siblings and to their wives and husbands. And you do not expect anything more from her. This is haram. This is totally prohibited. You have to give a separate home to your wife if you fear Allah Azza wa This is her God-given right. She says, okay, what about the rights of my mother and father? Be careful. These rights do not mix. Give your father and mother their rights, but give your wife her right as well. So give her her separate home and be dutiful, obedient, providing for your mother and father, even if you have to spend 10 hours with them, no problem. But your wife has to have her rights. One says, and I get hundreds of questions like this, my father or my mother orders me to divorce my wife. What should I do? I say, you, you must not obey her. He says, but I have to be dutiful to her. Being dutiful to your mother does not mean you divorce your wife. This is not fair. This is injustice. One claims, okay, there's a hadith where Umar ordered his son to divorce his wife. And the Prophet say, said to Umar, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, obey your father. So what to do? One of the great imams was asked the same question. A man came to him and said, my father orders me to divorce my wife. And Umar did this with his son and the prophet ordered him to obey his father. What should I do? The, the, the imam said, when your father is as great as Umar, obey him. Umar is fair. Umar is the second caliph. He would not do anything. So if your wife is obedient, Muslima, practicing, kind, but your mother doesn't like her guts at all, she doesn't like her, then your mother is transgressing and unfair. You cannot obey her in such an issue. But if your wife is disobedient, rude, abusive, not kind, not a good wife, ditch her, yachi. what are you keeping her for? You're still young, marry someone else. See, it is demand and supply. <laughs> Don't laugh. I know you will hate me for this. Anytime I write on Twitter, people attack me like this. They don't understand. They don't have knowledge. It is demand and supply. There are so many women out there you can get married to. And if you get married to, a woman's best strategy is to be a slave in the house. Sheikh, where is women power? Not here. If you manage to be submissive and treating your husband with humility and weakness, he's like a ring in your finger. But if he marries another man in the, in the shape of a woman, he says, do this. Why don't you do that? Okay, can you do this? No, you do that. And she is another man in his house. This is not a healthy marriage. Yes, he is obliged to be kind to her, to love her, to shelter her, to provide for her. But at the same time, she's also obliged to be feminine, to be a woman, to be fragile. If they manage to have this chemistry, 
you have a long successful marriage inshallah azza wa jal now being dutiful to your mother doesn't at all mean by the way when i open my mobile i'm not checking my whatsapp actually this is a lie i am checking my whatsapp <laughs> but i'm not checking whatsapp for personal um, uh, messages i'm getting snapshots of the book so that i can know the title of the hadith in arabic which i did not record in my notes that's why so don't think that i'm answering uh, messages so we come to a very important issue. Being dutiful to your mother has to be within the parameters of Islam. Why do we say this, Sheikh? Because a lot of us think that being dutiful to your mother is to buy her a bottle of perfume on Mother's Day. When is Mother's Day? Ahsant, that's the question, the answer. Every day is a Mother's Day to us Muslims. The non-Muslims have one day a year, and they bring her flowers and they throw it and they leave. Us Muslims, we think of our mother every single day. We visit, we bring food and vegetables and fruits and whatever she likes. We go and massage her foot. We ask her, do you want to go for Umrah? We ask her, what do you like to have? We do our level best to be kind to our mother. This is how a Muslim should be. We move on to hadith number, number what? Uh, number four. It's in the same uh, chapter, is it not? Where's the moderator? It's not the same chapter, huh? Type. An Ata an Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum. A man came. I will read from the Arabic because I hate reading English. So you follow the English. I'll do the instant translation in my head. I never read English, by the way. It's all in Arabic. So he said, I proposed to a woman and she refused or rejected me. And then another man came and proposed to her and she agreed to him. I felt jealous, so I killed her. Do I have any repentance? So Ibn Abbas said, is your mother alive? He said, no. He said to him, then repent to Allah. Do as much as you can to get closer to Allah. Ata, the tabi'i, went to Ibn Abbas and said, why did you ask him about his mother's life, whether she's alive or dead? He said, I know no good deed that would get a person closer to Allah than being dutiful to the mother. Now this hadith is very strange. When you read this hadith, what is the first thing that comes into mind? My mind. This man, does he love this woman? Yes, raise your hands. No, this is strange how thin the hairline between hatred and love is. And this is an explanation, an example to what goes into a man's heart. If you loved her so much, you would love the very best for her. But when you do not love you want to possess only, then this hatred can come. A lot of our Muslim marriages are like this. They're built on possession, not love. So I want you to be my property. You belong to me. You're my possession. I do not want to share you with anyone else. This is not love. If something happens, you find hatred surfacing. And this is why he had no problem in killing her. And what actually resulted or caused the killing is envy. And this is one of the greatest sins on earth. Envy. 
I want you to be deprived of what you have, either if I have it or not, no problem. So if I see you driving a fast car, I'm happy for you. And I say, inshallah, I will one day have a, a similar car. If I'm envious, I would say, wallah, you don't deserve this car. May Allah bring you a big crash. And it is all into ruin. A'udhu billah. Ya khi, at least say, may Allah bless it to him. So, no, no, no. He doesn't deserve it. If I see a brother marrying a righteous, practicing, and beautiful wife, I said, may Allah divorce them. Why? Ya khi, he's not deserving of it. It's not your business. Allah has given it. No, no, still. He should not have this. The first sin, the scholars say, ever committed in this universe was due to envy. When Allah ordered Satan, Iblis, Shaitan, to prostrate to Adam, he became envious. Why prostrate to him? I am better. I was created from fire and he was created from clay. He became envious and resulted in him being cursed until the day of judgment accordingly. Now, why would you become envious? Why would a person become envious? Why would you look at some, someone's possessions and want to want it to leave? This is a result of one of the highest and greatest characteristic that a Muslim could have. If you don't have this characteristic, you become envious. What is that? Content. Ar-rida. If you're content with what Allah has given you, you will never be envious to anyone. And you will be the happiest person on earth. So if a sister is content with her husband, even if he's a gorilla, she is the happiest woman on earth. People come to her, his mouth smells like rotten eggs. He showers once every three weeks. His teeth are crooked. He's this short, long, tall, thin, fat, ugly, black, white. And she says, MashaAllah, I love him. He's the love of my life. This content makes her the happiest person on earth. If you don't have this content, you are the most depressed person on earth. You can find someone who is sweeping the floor, a janitor, and the smile is this big. Why are you happy? Alhamdulillah, I'm healthy, I have a family, I have a salary, I have a job. Yes, but you don't have a car, you don't have a motorcycle, you walk. Alhamdulillah, I'm healthy. And you look at the multi-millionaires who have food, cars, who have everything. Are they happy? No. You find a billionaire sad. Why are you sad? You have three air jets, airplanes of your own. He said, yeah, but my friend bought a new 777 extended version with a, a saloon and a bedroom. And I, did, I don't have this. Subhanallah. So content is the greatest blessing of Allah Azza wa Jal. And finally, this shows you how great trusting Allah Azza wa Jal and being dutiful to your mother. What is this? Unless we finish the course. Uh, uh, dutifulness to your the mother. So Ibn Abbas had it fixed. This is common knowledge for all companions. Being dutiful to your mother is one of the greatest deeds that Allah erases your sins. You don't have to go for Umrah. You don't. It's good if you go, especially when they don't have to pay much money for that. I think they've uplifted the, the fees as I was told, alhamdulillah. So you can go for free now. Um, it's not from me, it's from the government. You don't have to do a lot of things. Just be soft speaking to your mother. Be kind, bring her a gift, do things that she loves. And Allah Azza wa Jal would love you accordingly. Okay, so we go on to chapter... Allah, this is confusing. Chapter 7, right? 
حديث نمبر 15 اوكي ابو بكره is there a spelling mistake is it ابو بكر or ابو بكره or are they the same person hello where's the microphone it's the same person no it's a different person this man's name abu bakrah al-thaqafi and if you read the seerah of the prophet on the eighth year of hijra when the prophet besieged taif in after the battle of hunayn he besieged taif for maybe 18 days and it was a fortress the prophet could not and his army penetrated so the companions called to the slaves of taif whoever comes to us muslim he's free so one of them was this man he came down through a rail rail in arabic is bakra where you put the rope when you know the rail where you put a rope and to bring water from the well so he tied himself to one and came down so that was why he was nicknamed as abu bakra so abu bakra said that the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam was sitting with us one day and then he asked us <coughs> he said shall i tell you which is the worst of the major sins and then he repeated it again and then he repeated it for the three, third time and this was a habit of the prophet alayhi salam that he used to repeat some of his speeches three times so that people can be first of all alert secondly to memorize it so so many times i say a word and 95% of the people do not listen or pay attention to it this happens especially in an 8 hour course if i repeat it again you'll be awake if i repeat it for the third times it sticks but then we would need like 6 years to finish the course therefore we will just move on inshallah so he repeated this he's informing them about the most major sins because he wanted to captivate their attention so that they would pay attention to it so the first they said oh, definitely oh prophet of allah teach us so he said first of all associating others with allah in arabic shirk so shirk is the as they call it in english the cardinal sin we don't have cardinals but is the most major sin that allah does not forgive at all whoever dies in the state of shirk is bound to hell fire for eternity not a thousand years a million forever so this is pretty serious then the prophet said as a salam and disobeying parents the word is not the correct translation the correct translation for the word in arabic is uquq al walidain and uquq is far greater than disobeying it's also disrespecting it's also being not dutiful to your parents so again this is one of the major sins and the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam was sitting leaning on his side inclined this is usually when you sit on the floor you get a couch or a, a pillow and you sit uh, leaning on it to rest your back he was sitting like this then he stood up straight and he said uh, false testimony meaning i think the translation in the book is different right lies this is not what is meant here in the hadith it is false testimony lies is general i can lie to a friend i can lie to a judge i can lie to a wife this is general lying false testimony this can only be in front of a judge and the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam kept on repeating it so one would ask and argue why would he 
do that? Before we get into this, first of all, the hadith teaches us, tells us that there are major sins and there are minor sins. What is the difference? Major sins, as the scholars define it, any sin that Allah has cursed the one who does it, or said that he would be tormented in hellfire, or that he would be exited from Allah's mercy, or that there is a prescribed punishment for it in this world. This is, generally speaking, the most authentic definition of kabira, major sin. What is a major sin? So any sin that you find that Allah cursed or will put into hell or is kicked out of Allah's mercy or there's a prescribed punishment such as killing, stealing, uh, drinking intoxicants, slandering, fornicating, all of these have prescribed punishment in this life, then you know that this is a major sin. Now, we can spend the rest of the day talking about associating others with Allah. But this is not, is not our topic. Yet, maybe, maybe, we should just highlight some of the things that people do not know as shirk. For example, prostrating to Buddha is shirk, of course. No problem. This is crystal clear. Slaughtering to the graves of awliya and pious people, shirk. Calling the dead, O oh, Hassan, O oh, Hussein, O oh, Tijani, Jilani, uh, Badawi, uh, Naqshabandi, anything. Calling them, please help me, grant me this, protect me from this. This is also shirk. Even going to soothsayers. You go to someone asking about something of the future. Wallah, the priest told me that next week there'll be riots. Don't go to this route. Ah. Oh. And you believe him? Yes, he, he, he knows the future. This is shirk, kufr. Takes you out of religion, out of Islam completely. And so many uh, other things that are involved. So now, the Prophet والسلام, as for not being dutiful, respectful, obedient to your parent, said a very scary hadith. 15 minutes for what? We're just warming up. <laughs> Subhanallah. I think we should cancel this workshop. We'll not be able to finish anything by this uh, paste. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the Jannah, paradise, will not be entered by one. Al-Mannan. Who's the Mannan? The one who does you a favor and then keeps on reminding you. Didn't I give you 10 ringgits six years ago? Yeah, you gave it to me. Khalas, six years depreciation and the oil prices are falling. Khalas. It keeps on reminding you, I did you a favor, I gave you my car, I lent you my house, I uh, uh, helped you in your wedding. This will not enter Jannah. The Prophet says, a person who is not dutiful, not obedient, not respectful to his parents, he will not enter Jannah. And a drunkard, someone who is addicted to drinking alcohol intoxicants, he will not enter Jannah. And one would ask, okay, how would I not be dutiful, respectful, obedient? Allah mentioned in the Quran that even the slightest gesture of disapproval, of discontent is considered to be uquq. So Allah says in the Quran, what is the gesture? Uf. What is this? Oof, nothing. So my father says, um, there are groceries in the trunk of the car. Bring them up. I said, okay. 
Allah says this is being disrespectful and not dutiful. Just the gesture. It is haram. It is a major sin to say this to your parents. And if this is prohibited, what about if someone shouts as his parents? What about someone who curses his parents, who raises his voice and abuse his parents? I've seen this with my own eyes, heard it with my own ears. People being abusive to their parents. A man came to me once in the masjid crying, and he was in his mid-50s, mid-50s. He said, I have the worst mother on earth. He's Egyptian. And my father died, leaving us a very beautiful reputation. My mother goes from house to house, spoiling his reputation, trying to cause enmity between people. People come to me and complain, your father was a good man. Why is your mother causing us problems? I keep on advising her, trying to be dutiful to her. One day, it went out of hand, and I, slammed, I slapped her on the face. My mother is, uh, uh, is in her mid-80s. And he comes to me in the masjid after Isha, crying like a baby, his mid-50s, saying, what, what can I do? How can I repent? What do you answer such a person? To us, his mother needs to be in front of a firing squad. She's evil, pure evil. But you, as a son, has no right to do anything of this. It's your test and exam from Allah. You must be obedient, tolerant, respectful. Give her kind advice and pray to Allah Azza wa You may not do anything else, let alone abusing her or uh, uh, slapping her on the face. A lot of the people would justify being undutiful to their parents because their parents were undutiful to them. So I say, why would I obey my father if he prefers my brother over me? If he doesn't provide for me shelter, I get sisters calling me saying that our father left the house when we were children, infants. I don't remember anything of him or him sending us money or him taking care of us or calling us or seeing us. And after 20 years, he contacted us and wants us to become like father and daughter. He, she says, I cannot meet him. I don't want to see him. I'd like to spit in his face. Is this halal? I don't know anything about him. I said, no, this is haram. He's your father. He's your biological father. He is your father by birth in Islam, and you must be dutiful to him. His sins, Allah will hold him accountable for. But remember, if you don't do your duty, Allah will hold you accountable for that as well. And at the end of the day, it's duties and uh, obligations, rights and obligations as they say. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah's pleasure, Allah's pleasure is in the pleasure of the parents. If you want Allah to be pleased with you, please your parents. So whenever you do something, don't do it because you love them. We all love our parents. Do it because it would get you closer to Allah, the Almighty. And the third thing is, of course, uh, um, uh, the false testimony. And this by itself, I have prepared so many points, but I don't think that it would be feasible to go through them. However, it is extremely important. It's one of the major sins in Islam to testify falsely. I don't know if it happens here. In the countries where Sharia is implemented, it's sufficient to bring two witnesses to win a court case. So if you don't have religion, if you don't have Iman, you can buy two and they can testify. And this is what makes it scary because repenting would not suffice. You have to rectify and correct 
the damage you have done. So me and him have a dispute on this water bottle. And you can imagine if this is a one million meter property or an island or a hundred million rials or ringgit worth of money and we have a dispute. So in Islam, the way to, if you come to a judge and you have a dispute on this property, how would I judge? Very simple, straightforward. You have to provide the one who claims. This is mine, Sheikh. I said, okay, give me the evidence. What evidence do you want? A written document stating that he took it from you. I don't have any documents. Then bring me two witnesses, Muslims, to testify that he took it from you. I don't have any witnesses, Sheikh. In this case, the Sheikh goes to the other defendant and say, this man claims you took this from him. Is it true? He says, no, Sheikh, it's not true. This man failed to bring me evidence. Therefore, you must testify by Allah that it is not his and you did not take it from him. Can you swear by Allah? He said, yes, I swear by Allah. If he swears by Allah, the judge says, it's yours. I cry. It's mine. Prove it. If you can't prove it, then anyone claim is as good as mine. And this man's swore by Allah, it's his. Halas, it is his. So the evidence is important, having two witnesses. If you go to a court of law and you bring these two witnesses and they testify by Allah that this belongs to him or to him or to him, the judge judges according to evidences and facts. I don't know what's in the heart. So he gives it to you. This is why it makes it one of the major sins in Islam. Because you are abusing Allah's name. You swear lying. Do you think that Allah will leave you Go and enjoy the money, the bribe, the thing that you have gained out of it? No, Allah. If Allah takes the blessing out of anything you have, you are doomed. Imagine, I do this sometimes, don't think I'm crazy. I might be. Just to appreciate Allah's blessing on me, I go into the toilet to answer the call of nature with the lights off. And believe me, it's a mess. But I come out appreciating that Allah has given me sight. When you have an injury in your knee and you cannot pray except on a chair, how do you appreciate it? When you have a stomach ache that doesn't hold any food in your stomach, you cannot drink water, you throw up. You cannot eat anything and you are in pain and agony for a day only. After you get well, how do you feel? Do you remember? Everything we have and do is due to the blessing of Allah. If Allah takes this blessing away from you, your life is over. You are doomed. And this is why whenever you do something, think of the consequences. Yes, I can lie. I can testify falsely. I will gain money. I will gain reputation. I will get a better position in my career. But what all of this would avail me if Allah has taken the blessing and favor out of it, it will become a menace. It will become an illness and it will become something that Allah Azza wa Jal does not approve of. So part of that false testimony is what a lot of us do not in court. A lot of the people come to me and say, Sheikh, what do you think of brother so-and-so? He has proposed to my daughter. He has to pro propose to my sister. Now, whatever I say will impact the life of the sister. They trust me. So I say, oh, mashallah, this man is one of Allah's greatest awliya. He is a scholar. He is practicing. He is righteous. He is like a medicine you put on a wound and it recovers, mashallah. And I know that he's drunkard, he's fornicator, he doesn't pray, and he has a cross under his shirt. Why are you doing this? 
He's my friend, Ya Sheikh. I cannot say bad things about him. Subhanallah. This is false testimony. Your boss comes to you and asks you about a colleague. What do you think of Brother Ahmed? Oh, Brother Ahmed comes on time, leaves on time, does all of his work beautifully. And you know that this is not true because you want him to get a raise or the opposite. He, a'udhu billah, he is like a small snake going around the colleagues and biting them. He's bad, he lies, he's corrupt, he doesn't have this. Why? Because you want the race to come to you, not to him. All of this is false testimony. And you can cascade this all over your life. And that is why part of the adab, that you do not tell a lie, that you do not testify except of what you had seen. So many things we get on our WhatsApp, this is what I call stupid phones, not smartphones. These make you more stupid. WhatsApp is the menace of society. I get little people, I, I usually ignore anything that comes to me, except from my groups, certain groups. And I have so many things coming to me. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu so and so and so, and so. spread it and Allah will give you reward. It's a lie. Hadiths, lies, fabrications, and you have rumors. People circulating things. The government did this and that. The opposition did this and that. Imam of the masjid did this and that. Sheikh so and so did this and, and so lies. Have you witnessed it yourself? Have you? If you did not witness it, Allah will hold you questionable on the day of judgment. Allah says in the Quran, and they made the angels of Allah females. The idol worshippers, they call the angels to be females. And the angels are genderless. They don't have, they don't, uh, uh, we don't call them males or females. They, they are without gender. So Allah is blaming and condemning people, idol worshippers who made the angels to be female, females. Allah says afterwards, Ashahidu khalqahum. Had they witnessed the creation of the angels in order for them to say whether they're females or males, Allah says afterwards, Satuktabu shahadatuhum wa yusalun. Their testimony will be registered and they will be questioned. Whatever you get on WhatsApp or on your emails or on your Facebook and you forwarded it without testifying, without witnessing it, Allah would hold you questionable. Imagine just yesterday, how many messages have you forwarded? I said, well, well I don't know. It came from this brother or from this sister. Uh, they, they're responsible. No, you forwarded it. You are responsible for it. So inshallah, we have like 15 minutes. Yalla. I'll be generous. 15 minutes, inshallah, and we'll meet up.